All right, how many of you are excited about having most of you your first ever worry-free summer? How about that, huh? Let's give it up for God it is going to be a worry-free summer, and we're continuing in our worry-free series right now, church. One more time, put your hands together. Let's welcome in Orange Park, St. John's, all of our locations, uh, those watching on the web right now. We are so glad that you are here with us this weekend. We're continuing in our worry, uh, worry-free worry series today, but before we get into today's message, listen, you know, I've been out of the pulpit for the last few weeks, even though I've been here most of those weekends, but I am back this coming Sunday. That's right, dads. It is Father's Day weekend, and it is on. That's so weak. Some of you guys just... Golly, listen, it is going to be awesome. Look, we're doing barbecue pit masters. I want to let you know that I am serving up my own hog. That's right, a big old hog that I shot this past hunting season. So it is organic barbecue ribs from Pastor Stovall and a lot of other great things, guys. We got some fun giveaways. It's going to be a fantastic Father's Day. Man, I got a a really encouraging message for you. And then I'm going to be speaking uh, the next few weekends. And in fact, I just realized I'm uh, I'm here or I'm speaking, I think, all but three weekends all the way up until uh, the first weekend in October. So uh, thank you. So glad about a third of y'all like it when I speak. But listen, the rest of y'all, the rest of y'all, I'm going to really work hard. But, you know, there's so much going on here uh, this summer, man. I'm, I'm ready to lock in and just have a great time. And I know many of you are going to be traveling, but don't travel from God. We've got Hillsong, uh, Young and Free coming here. We've got our big youth weekend. You saw I'll be speaking that weekend, but the youth are going to lead the service. It's going to be a blast. You're going to get to see what God is doing in the next generation. Then we've got some great series for you, a great series coming in July. So it's going to be an awesome summer. I hope that you can plug in and hang around with us. But today, uh, we have a real good friend of mine speaking, Pastor Steve Robinson, who's pastor's Church of the King in Mandeville, Louisiana, a church of thousands and thousands of people. You are going to love Pastor Steve. Many of you know him. He has spoken here uh, a few times before. He's become a dear friend to me, and we just love to have him. So church, I want you to put your hands together. Come on, at all of our locations, put your hands together. I want you to give a celebration welcome for Pastor Steve Robinson. Thanks, buddy. All right. Wow. What a wonderful, wonderful sense of God's presence. I tell you, one of the things I love about Celebration Church is I love the worship the presence of God. You walk in and you just sense it. Isn't that right? And it is such an honor and such a joy to be here. And I want to thank Pastor uh, Stovall and Carrie and the whole team. And what a great team. Listen, let me tell you something. You don't have the opportunity maybe like I do to go and see churches around the country, but this is a great church with God's hand upon it led by great leaders. Come on, can we give it up for, come on, give it up for your pastors. Awesome. Yes. Today, I want to jump right into our series. We're in a series called Worry Free here at Celebration Church, and I want to give you some practicals of how we can overcome worry or anxiety. That's a synonymous word uh, in the English language, worry and anxiety. See, here's what I believe. I believe the Bible is clear. We don't have to live a defeated life. We don't have to live succumbing to worry and anxiety. I love the scripture in 1 John 5, 4. Here's what it says. John writes, "For for everyone born of God overcomes. Can you say that word with me? What? Overcomes. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. It's our faith in God. Today I want to talk to you about overcoming worry and anxiety. Speaking of anxiety, you know, every summer I have the opportunity to uh, go on a vacation, really lock in during the school year. Of course, I got four kids, a 17-year-old daughter, 15-year-old son, 14-year-old son, uh, and a little four-year-old daughter. And last summer I had the opportunity to go with my then 12-year-old boy, William, uh, to Tennessee. 
And we had a great time. And we brought another pastor friend and his son who are the same age. They were both 12 years old. We did everything. I mean, we went fishing and fly fishing. And we went canoeing. And one of the things that they wanted to do was go uh, whitewater rafting. We got to the airport and got a bunch of brochures. And this one's good. And this one, I was trying to steer away from the radical ones. I was kind of going a little mellow thing, you know. And so they picked one and a wild something. I forgot even what the name of it. It was the Wild Rapid Water Ride. So we go to the place, and we were there a couple, two, three days in Tennessee at our hotel. And we go to the place, and it's really interesting because you got to get on a bus, and you got to go probably about a 20-minute ride up this mountain where they drop you off, and then you, 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 you raft down. And it's interesting on the bus, you always have the small talk with dad, you know, what do you do, and you know, and what kind of work, and how many kids you got. So people, you know, what do you do for a living? You know, and I was like, well, you know, and I'm always trying to steer away from the fact that I'm a pastor because when I tell people that, they behave differently. So I'll tell them, you know, I was just, I, you know, pu public speaker and uh, <laughs> just, you know, and no, really, I mean, well, what do you speak about? You know, I just, I just like help, just, just kind of help people and everything, you know, and this one guy was really persistent. He kept pressing me. No, no, like, what do you speak about? Like, what is your job? You know, and he's kind of dropping bombs before that, um, <laughs> curse bombs. And so there's bombs. And uh, so I finally told him, I said, dude, I said, really, it's, you know, I'm a pastor. Oh, Father, I'm so sorry. I, I just, oh. So there it is. See, that they, they're going to behave differently now. So anyway, we get there, and there's this little guy about 22 who's our, rat, who's our river guide. You know, it looked like he just, just climbed right out of the river, been there his whole life. He said, hey, dude, you know, I'm your guide. You know, make sure to put your hand on top of this thing, man. If not, it may hurt somebody. It actually hit somebody. You know, you can really hurt somebody. This is dangerous. This is like a weapon, dude. And so there's some fours, some threes, and there's a secret five on there. I won't tell you when it's coming. And so I was like, that ain't cool. But anyway, so... So we get in the boat, and I'm thinking it's going to be like, you know, 30 minutes. We, like two minutes, we hit this. He called it a four. We're going back and forth. Literally, I'm almost flowing out. I mean, literally, I'm almost falling out of the boat. So one of the guys go, pray for us, pastor. I'm like, I'm not at work, you know. <laughs> I'm like, what's up? So we go down the thing. I'm so anxious. I mean, I'm, I'm full of anxiety. You know, I'm like, you know, my son's like, isn't this fun? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> we get to the end. He goes, we only have a half mile more. Now, I'm not making this up. Literally from nowhere, there's like rainstorm moves in. It's like black clouds. And I'm telling you, I'm in the middle of East Tennessee and lightning. It's like crack, crack. One hit so loud. It's like 100 yards away. Seriously. And I'm like, sir, Mr. Guide, what do you think? I mean, are we going to be okay? He goes, we're in a rubber boat, Pastor. We're fine. <laughs> now, I got to tell you, I was so excited. So great. I got off. I kissed the ground when we finished. I was like. Now, the reality is that was over in about two hours. But that's how some of your lives are right now. With your kids and your job. In relationships. As things are just all over the place. And when that happens, there's that, those feelings of anxiety and worry and fear. And the fact is. You've been trying to get off the raft for a long time, but every day it's the same thing. Today I want to talk to you about how to overcome worry, how to overcome anxiety from the Bible. If you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to open up to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Anxiety is prominent in the lives of so many people in our culture. It's, it's epidemic. It's important to note, though. I want to qualify it for It's important to note. Anxiety and worry is not sin. Listen to me closely. But if you don't deal with it, it can lead you to sin. It's very, very important that you understand that anxiety, what is it? In the New Testament, the word anxiety, here's what it means. All right, let me unpack it. Here's the definition. It means to be distracted, divided. Now watch this. It means to be divided or pulled apart. What's so interesting is when you look in the scripture, the Hebrew word for peace, shalom, it means just the opposite. Anxiety means to be divided. Peace, biblical peace means to be whole. Isn't that interesting? 
So when you're anxious, when you're dealing with worry, listen, it, it, it does something. It starts small, but if you don't deal with it, if you don't snuff it out, it's like a little fire. It starts small. It can end up consuming your whole life. Archbishop Arthur Roche says worry is a, it's a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. If encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. You may start with just a little worry, but if you don't deal with it, and that's why today in the scripture I'm going to teach you how to overcome it, how to not succumb to it, not submit to it. It starts small, but it can invade every part of your life. Interesting, I did some study and research this week on fog, and fog is a really interesting, you ought to check this out on the internet, because everything on the internet's true. Just joking. <laughs> but you ought to check this out. I, I this is a, 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 a really interesting point. A whole city block with 100 feet high of fog. Now, you got to think about this. That's a lot of fog, all right, huge. Do you know what, the amount of water particles in that whole entire massive fog comes from less than one pitcher of water? There's, there's less than one pitcher of water. What's the point in saying that? Something that's so small, something that seems so inconspicuous, it, it seems so small and so subtle, yet it can, it can watch this with fog, shut down a whole city block. Remember, I want to say that worry is not sin, but it can lead us to sin. It can, it can color every part of our life. Isn't it interesting? Jesus, when he begins his public ministry, when he begins the very first sermon that he preaches, the very first thing that he talks about on the famous Sermon on the Mount, I've been to Israel, and uh, where in the northern region of Israel, the, the Galilean region, they have what's called uh, the Mount of Beatitudes, where the Beatitudes, blessed are those, that this, blessed are those. Well, well, part of that whole Sermon on the Mount, Jesus deals with the topic of worry. Isn't it interesting that one of the very first things he talks about to humanity is worry? Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your, watch this, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Isn't that powerful? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cupid to his stature? So, why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. If you step back and look at this passage, it's really interesting because the words of Jesus are so powerful. Here's the deal. Right now, at this moment in the ministry of Christ, remember, there's what's called the 400 silent years in the intertestamental period between the Old and the New Testament. And Jesus breaks on the scene, and here's what he says. Don't worry. Why? Because your father knows. Listen, he's interested in your needs. He knows what you need, and he cares about it. In other words, he is attempting to communicate that, that, that though you may fear, don't worry. Your father knows. He knows what you're concerned about. He knows about your kids. He knows about your job. He knows about those relationship issues. You're loved. You're cared for by God. You know what worry does? Listen, let me just tell you this about anxiety. Anxiety is not your friend. It's not cute. It's like, you know those little dogs that, you know, they kind of just little small and they're a little cute. And, 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 and then there's the big dogs that protect. Anxiety is not your friend. Anxiety has, listen, you need to put a no trespassing sign in your house. You're not welcome here. Anxiety attempts to convince you that God doesn't care. It, it, it attempts to convince you God doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about your needs, your family, your finances, your health. What are some sources of anxiety? Let me give you three. Number one, sometimes we experience anxiety because of irresponsible living. I, uh, I have, like I said, four kids, and my two boys are a trip. They're 16 months apart. They're full on. They're active. I mean, they're just like, you know, you have one kid that's just sometimes just real full on, and then one a little bit more quiet. They both have the exact same personality from my wife. Anyway, so <laughs> everything comes from her family. It's interesting. So, so I would like to say my kids just finished exams, but I'd like to add they were junior hires. I just finished exams. 
Any dads know what I'm talking about? No, you're going to study all right. You know, they get up, I'm freaked out that I'm so stressed. All right, time out, time out. Sometimes we get freaked out and stressed and worried and anxious because we've been irresponsible in our preparation. So sometimes it's, it doesn't have anything to do with the devil or the fallen world. It has to do with we didn't prepare. So sometimes it's just irresponsible living. Let me tell you another reason. Sometimes it's legitimate challenges. Some things that naturally go wrong. We, live in, we do live in a fallen world, and there are things that we can't control. We can't control the weather patterns, tornadoes and hurricanes and things coming. Any significant shift in the economy, the world. There is a, maybe a change in your health. And, and when that happens, there's this, watch this, there's these thoughts that start swirling around. I can't believe this is happening. Where is God? What's going on? You begin to get nervous and feel these feelings of anxiety. And remember, remember this, emotions are neutral. Emotions are a byproduct of recurring thought patterns. So whatever you think about long term, you start to feel. Remember this, when you feel anxious, it's because you've been projecting mentally and analyzing things where, where there's some negative outcomes, possibilities for your life. So now there's legitimate things. For instance, hurricane season. It's for us in South Louisiana. You know, they start on the news and hurricane season. You have to prepare. But boy, that spirit, man, that you can just get so anxious and nervous. And here's the thing. One of the things that we have to realize is what we can control and what we can't control. We can't control the weather patterns, but we can control our responses to the weather patterns. Let me give you a third reason why some people are anxious, and it's irrational fears. Sometimes it's irresponsible living, sometimes legitimate challenges, sometimes it's just irrational fears. We can feel anxious, we can get nervous, just because it's and, and just irrational. I got a friend whose wife, who has a mom, and she's still alive, and uh, she is just the most nervous, anxious person I've ever met in my whole entire life, and she feels it's her God assignment to send all the potential physiological challenges that are now released in the earth, and that there's anything, did you touch a doorknob at a restaurant recently, do you realize the bacteria attached to that, do you realize your kids, and that's going to stunt their growth, and do you realize the reason why they're here, and all this stuff, and she, it's, I mean, when they tell me, they came to counseling one time for me as a couple, and I was like, stop, I'm just nervous. The reality is, is that those phobias and those fears, let me tell you something. I'm not talking about legitimate concerns. I'm talking about stuff we feed in our mind that is unwarranted and should be unwelcomed. Phobias. Phobias. And they just float around. And what about this? I'm like, what about this? And man, I'm not sure about this. And the reality is that we can control the input so that we can control the output. Anxiety is not your friend. Everybody say that. Say anxiety. It's not my friend. So what should our posture be towards worry and anxiety? Again, I'm just going to continue down the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 31, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first. Repeat that with me. Seek what? Say it. That's what I love about Pastor Stovall's book. Man, it's so powerful. God first. Isn't it interesting how oftentimes people will try second, third, fourth, when I've tried everything else, when I've called and got everybody's public opinion, yet the Bible, listen, the Bible didn't say he's against counsel from other people, but everybody say God first. Come on, say it. Not second, God first. God first in your family, God first in your finances. That's a massive key to overcoming anxiety. That's a massive key to overcoming worry. Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. It's amazing how some people, you know, they, their lives get all banged up and all bruised up. And oh, might as well try the Lord. Why are you trying God? Let's put him first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know what the seductive lie of worry says? Here's what it says. By stressing today, I will have certainty tomorrow. That's a lie. Your stressing today doesn't produce security for tomorrow. It just produces more paranoia in your soul, more anxiety. Anxiety is in scriptural 12 times. If you look in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 12 times Jesus specifically says, don't worry, don't be anxious. Three times in the Sermon on the Mount, as well, just right here in this first sermon, worry not, don't be anxious. 
It's interesting when you begin to understand the effects of it, how it affects every part of our lives. It slows down our productivity and work. You, you, you have a divided mind, divided interest. You're, you lack intentionality. It affects every part. Do you know that 75 to 90% of all the primary care health visits are related to stress, anxiety, and worry? All the medical people we have at all the campuses, whether St. John's or Orange Park, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You see patients, they come in, the nurses, you, you, you begin to evaluate. So much of this anxiety is not your friend. You can overcome anxiety. You don't have to succumb to anxiety. The Bible equips us to live a worry-free life. Anxiety affects our relationship. You ever try to emotionally bond with somebody that's real nervous? It's like... And you're not really sure where they are. Look, I'm a hyperactive kid. I get it. Look, in the 70s, I mean, I was in the 70s. They didn't have, like, hyperactivity, you know, dumb everybody down. They would just stick us under a desk in the early 70s. You shut up. Don't talk. You're making everybody crazy. <laughs> you get under there. We'll let you out after science. I mean, that's what they did to us. But you try to bond with people who are anxious, real nervous, you're not sure. You begin to protect yourself. Isn't that right? Why? Because you never know where they're coming from. Anxiety is not your friend. God wants us to overcome anxiety and worry. It leads to unwise decisions. When you're anxious and you're nervous, we often make the wrong decisions. I, I love what uh, 19th century preacher, great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon said, Anxiety does, does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows but empties today of its strength. God wants you strong, strong in your marriage, strong in your soul, strong in your family, strong in your job, strong in your church, in your community, serving the community. Well, pastor, how can I be strong, strong in the Lord? We've got to learn how to overcome anxiety. We've got to learn how to not submit to worry. Let me give you three things. If you guys have notes at the campuses, uh, here at the arena, I'm going to ask you guys if you have a pen. You may want to write this down. It's one of the messages that you want to probably go over and over. The internet campus, all the different ones. Let's, let's write these down. I'm going to give you three things, three ways that we biblically can live free of anxiety. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. Do you realize the quality of our life, how we would change if we just lived these first five or six verses, words of this verse? Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Spanish, nada. <laughs> Isn't that right? Be anxious for nothing. Just pause. What if we really live that way? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. But in what, say it? So be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, here's what it's going to do. It's going to guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Number one, bring your worries to God in prayer. Do you know the first step to living worry-free? The first step to living free of anxiety? You know what it is? Is that we've got to confess it. In other words, we've got to break the silence. See, as long as it's just all in our mind and we're playing mental gymnastics and we have what's called analysis paralysis, and sometimes part of the business community, again, I understand strategic planning, I understand scenario planning, but sometimes that's a real sophisticated way of saying, I'm just worrying a bunch. And the reality is, is that we've got to bring those, as long as you want them or as long as you have them unto yourself, God's intervention, God's power can't help you. You've got to break this out. God, I'm worried about this. Watch this. Real practical. God, I'm concerned about my family. God, I'm concerned about my finance. I'm concerned about my health. Lord, I'm concerned about my kids. God, I'm asking you to help me. See, the beginning of anxiety, it's the end of faith. But the beginning of, watch this, faith, it's the end of anxiety. Faith means trust. Have you brought that concern to God in prayer? One of the things I've been teaching our church is stopping and pausing and asking somebody a question when they come to you about trouble. Here's what you need to say. Have you prayed about that? And the more that you say that to somebody, have you prayed about that? Notice it gets into your core as well. You start asking yourself that question. Have I prayed about this? See, when you pray about something, here's what you're doing. Here's what you're doing. God, I can't handle this situation on my own. God, 
I'm giving it to you because I need your help. See, it's so interesting when you begin to realize it's a process of prayer bringing those worries to God. I'm not suggesting they'll never come. We don't live in this panacea, utopian world, no issues. But when they come, what do you do with that problem? You got to bring it to God in prayer. Fear, worry, anxiety, it all stems from that lack of tra trust and faith. And yet the God of the universe is screaming down to us, I love you. I care about you. Some of you, you know I've had actually people tell me this in our church, well, pastor, I'll be honest. I know God's got a lot on his plate. He's feeding hungry people. I've literally had people that I'm not making this up. This is true. Pastor, I know God's been dealing with a lot of things around the world. I don't want to bring this small concern to God. Can I tell you something? Do you know in the Sermon on the Mount, God says he knows the hair on that used to be there on everyone's head. Okay, I just needed to cover every single person unless you felt I excluded a people group. God cares. Don't live your life as if God doesn't exist. As a Christian, don't live your life as if God doesn't answer prayer. But when you've got, yeah, when you've got an issue, bring it to God in prayer. Everybody say it. Do what? Say it. Bring it to God in prayer. You know, my daughter, I, again, I've got, three, I've got three older kids, 17, 15, 14, and then this little adopted daughter from China. She's the joy of our life. It's funny, my kids kind of cornered me a couple weeks ago like, Dad, we've got a real problem with you. We've noticed a pattern. Really? It's like you're not even hard on Annalise at all. It's like you don't even correct her. Mom truly does it. It's like you were so tough on us. What's changed? And I said, I'm tired. <laughs> Come on, anybody know? I, I just don't have the energy. I'm just like, y'all wore me out. So, so all of my kids, all of my kids, you know, we, 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 we live in this house and we had an upstairs, downstairs, and we could hear the little feet pitter patter, pitter patter, where they come down the stairs at nighttime and they come like dive into our bed. Daddy, daddy, you know, what are you doing? You know, I'm scared. All of them. I mean, Isabel, 17, 15, and, and all of them. So, so, so Annalise is doing the same thing. She'll pitter, 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 pitter. And she just, it's like a heat-seeking missile. She comes and she just, boom. Because here's what she knows. If I can get to mom and dad, I'll be safe. See, here's the analogy. Listen, you've got to have so, we've got to have in our core, if we can just get this problem to God, then we'll be safe. Does that make sense? I got to get it to God. I got to get it to God. Number two. Trade your worry for worship. Trade your worry for worship. In the midst of anxiety and worry, we may not feel grateful or we may not feel like worshiping God. But one of the secrets I've learned for dispelling anxiety in my life is learning how to trade, listen, my worry for worship. What's coming out of your mouth? Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Let's go back and read it. I want to highlight a word. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with, here's the next word, thanksgiving. It's interesting, thanksgiving is a, it's so connected to praise and worship. Enter his courts with thanksgiving. And there's something out, thanksgiving and, and praise. And it's a worship term. Let your requests be made known to God. There's something about worship. There's something about turning your worry into worship. There's something about learning to fill our mouth with worship. You, did you know what church is on the weekend? Let, let me help you guys. You know what church is? Now, I'm a pastor, all right? So it's important for people to come to church. You ought to gather in the house of God. You ought to come. And even in the summertime, and even if you're out of town, tune in online. Uh, uh, David said, I was glad when they said unto me, it, it is time, it's time to go to the house of the Lord. So, but, but I'm going to tell you this. This is really a corporate gathering moment to infuse you with power and worship and great preaching from Pastor Stovall to equip you so that you can do the same thing on Monday, worship and pray and hear teaching in your car so that on Tuesday you can do, are y'all with me? This is like practice for the week. That's really what it is. And a lot of people reduce worship down to the 17 minutes on the weekend. Worship ought to be a part of our lives. It, it, it worship is, it's, 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 it's verbal. What we're taught, we're worshiping God. 
A couple months ago, I was telling my kids, I got, I mean, I'm not into technology. I mean, I, I've got some, I really don't get it, but I'm trying, you know. A couple months ago, I was like, told my son, I said, son, get, get, my, get my Walkman. <laughs> he goes, what are you talking about, Walkman? I'm like, 80s. But anyway, so I was fixing to put on my Zoom shirt too. Come on now. Come on, 40-somethings. But anyway. I got, I've got my iPad, my wife, I mean, my, not my daughter, had to teach me how to do this, put Pandora on and worship music and something about worship, something about filling your heart with worship and praise and honoring God, turning your worry into worship. It's verbal. We went through Hurricane Katrina. Our church was five years old. We went from 3,200 people in the building the weekend before to 1,350 a month later. You talk about devastating. Not any rational fear. Not irresponsible living, but a real practical possibility every year for us in greater New Orleans that something like that could happen. Two years ago, Hurricane Isaac was coming, and I'll be honest, Pastor Kerry, I was, I was, I was, I was freaking out. I was nervous. I was, in, I was just like, oh my gosh, we were getting ready. We had raised a bunch of money for a building. We were trying to lock in our loan. And, uh, and in the caveat, the bank language was, in case of a hurricane, this thing is, until this is closed, you know, so I'm like, oh my gosh, we're like weeks away from closing our loan, and, and here's this Hurricane Isaac's coming, and we were going up to Birmingham. We evacuated up to Birmingham. They made everybody evacuate, and I was just, I had all these thoughts going through my mind. What's going to happen? The what, the what it could have, should have, what if, what maybe, you, you know what I'm talking about? And, and just right in the midst of it, my kids are in the back of a van, and and just right in the middle, I said, honey, I, I just, I have to worship. My mind is just... And I just put in some worship music, and I just begin to sing to God. I said, and, and I just begin to worship God and pray in between. I said, God, you love me. You love our family. You're not playing a game with our church. You're not playing a game with my life. See, here's what worship does. Worship takes your focus off of your problems, and it puts it on the greatness of God. That's what it does. And I'm going to tell you, faith. Just faith began to flood my soul. There was a, because, because I began to see that God is able. Everybody say, turn your, worship, turn your worry into worship. Let me give you this third and final thing. You guys learn anything today? Thank you for three people excited. All right, here we go. <laughs> that was really encouraging. Three, third thing, fo focus your mind. Here it is. Focus your mind on the pure and the positive. Philippians 4, 8, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report. If there's any virtue, if anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You know what Paul's saying? Watch your thoughts. Take control of your anxious thinking. Focus on the good. Focus on the godly. Hey, let me just help everybody again. I've got just about one minute. Look up here. This is so important. Everybody at all the campuses, your emotions are neutral, they are a byproduct of direct conscious or subconscious recurring thought patterns. So if you want to feel different, you've got to change what you're putting into your mind. Does that make sense? You want to change, you want to make the switch. Anxiety, the feelings of fear, the feelings of anxiety are caused by recurring fearful thoughts that you are choosing to think about. And that's why you feel anxious. That's why you can go into a movie totally untrue, totally not real. It's a movie, and you can feel scared, and yet it's a total fictitious thing. Why? Because that's going into your mind. How much more in our, in our lives? That's why I want to just say, monitor what you're putting into your mind. I'm going to be honest. This is just me. I'm not putting a heavy on you. It's not legalistic. I don't watch news with people that are commentating because their emotion is attached to it, and I don't want the spirit of fear on them to jump on me. I want to cognitively process news without it getting into my emotions. Somebody on the news, you know, they're putting their spin and, you know, I just want the facts. Just give me the facts. So what do you put in your mind? You ought to have Pastor Stovall and Carrie and their podcasts and fill your mind with preaching that lifts your soul and lifts your life and worship music. See, here's the deal. Here's the deal. You want, I had a person come up to me at a prayer meeting and said, what do you, what do you, what do you, they said, Pastor, I'm depressed. Really? What have you been putting in your mind? Well, you know, I said, do you listen to Christian music? How about worship music? How about good preaching? Well, you know, I mean, I listen to 70s. You know, I said, cats in the cradle in the silver spoon ain't helping you, baby. Are you with me? Get the word in your heart. Get faith preaching in your life. Fill your mind. Everybody say, fill my mind. 
Fill your mind with the pure, the positive, the powerful framework of God's word, worship, and God's presence. And you watch your life. Watch this. Worry goes down. Anxiety goes down. And faith in a big God goes up. Come on. You guys receive that? You guys receive that? Let me pray for you, Pastor. Come on. Father, I, I just thank you for what you're doing, Lord, in the, in the lives of these precious people. And I thank you, God, that each one of us are taking notice of your word, taking notice of your words, Jesus, that to fear not, to worry not, but to cast our cares. We're going to give them to you, Jesus. We're going to worship you. We're going to honor you. We're going to meditate on the pure, the powerful, and the positive framework of your word. I bless your people in Jesus' name.